along that that love is probably the thing that we sing about most. Um, I've never heard a survey done, but I would suspect that 90% of the songs that we sing in our culture are about love. There are lots of songs about love, songs about falling in love, falling out of love, becoming disillusioned with love. Who can forget the great classic by the J. Giles band, Love Stinks? You love her, she loves him, and he loves somebody else, you just can't win. And so it goes till the day you die, this thing they call love, it's going to make you cry. Love Stinks. What a great song. Um, I've noticed recently that uh, certainly the tone um, in songs has changed. There seems to be a lot of breakup songs on the radio at the moment, a lot of songs about broken hearts and disillusionment. Um, there's even a tendency, uh, probably started back in the 1990s, where, where songwriters decided, well, let's, let's stop being... Um, let's stop pretending... Let's stop pretending that what we're singing about is love and we'll just make it explicit that what we're singing about is lust. Uh, not everybody that writes songs about love has been so cynical. In fact, if you dig into some of the great songs of our culture, you'll find some songs that really deeply reflect on this theme of love. Um, and I suspect that, that just the fact that there are so many songs written about love it probably tells us that somehow instinctively, as a species, we seem to understand that the whole meaning of life is found here. Although we're not entirely sure where to find it. Back in 1948, uh, Nat King Cole, African-American singer-songwriter, had his first hit with a song called Nature Boy. Do any of you remember Nature Boy? It's a very short little song that goes like this. There was a boy, a very strange enchanted boy. They say he wandered very far, very far over land and sea, a little shy and sad of eye, but very wise was he. And then one day, a magic day, he passed my way. And while we spoke of many things, fools and kings, this he said to me, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and to be loved in return. Um, Foreigner, back in 1984, released a song which I'm sure many of you would be familiar with. Some of you may be uh, not so familiar. Um, I want to know what love is. Uh, one of the great, uh, what do they call it? One of the great love ballads of the 80s. A song written by... Mick Jones, with a little help from the, the lead singer of the band, Lou Graham. Now, L Lou Graham uh, talks a little bit about uh, the, the writing of this story. Um, and he says that when, when Jones uh, first wrote this story, he was a bit reluctant to let anybody hear it because the song was so personal as he was writing about uh, things in his own life that he hadn't been able to resolve. And he, he wasn't too sure if he wanted to have millions of people uh, hear about it so he kept it to himself but eventually the band um, sort of polished the song up and released it and it was a, a massive hit I want to know what love is I want you to show me it's an extraordinary line in a song a confession that I don't actually know what it is that I'm looking for but I I know that this is what I need And most of the world thinks that it knows what love is. And you might have seen something like this floating around in recent years. Uh, this has been everywhere, hasn't it? Love is love. Uh, just before the service started, Joel said that's a bit of a tautology, isn't it? It doesn't really say anything. Love is love. Blue is blue. Up is up. It's not terribly helpful. But I suppose the whole point of this was to say that, well, it doesn't matter who loves and it doesn't matter who loves who. Isn't love always the same thing? Well, if you ever come across this in conversation, I'd suggest that you really take this up because um, 
actually, uh, uh, at Tom and Beth's wedding, which is now a bit over two years ago, um, I, sp- I spoke a little bit about this there. A, a lot of you would remember an old TV commercial for Castrol GTX2. Do you remember the Castrol GTX2 ads? Oils ain't oils. You know, some oils are better than other oils. Well, guess what? Loves ain't loves. What do you mean when you say love is love? What are you talking about at all when you talk about love? Um, C.S. Lewis wrote a book um, oh, back in the day, whenever it was, called The Four Loves. And, and he's talking about the fact that in Greek, the language of the New Testament, um, the Greeks actually had four words for love, four different types of love. Storge, which is uh, the love of the family, the love that parents have for children. Uh, Philia, uh, friendship love or brotherly love. I'm not quite sure what the picture is about here. Apparently, when you're friends, you like going and looking at the stars or something like that. It actually looks like the Southern Cross. So maybe when you're friends, you go exploring together. Um, Eros, which is romantic love or it can even be lust and then we have this word agape Um, this is an interesting word in the greek world because you you hardly ever find it the greek philosophers never used it it hasn't been found once in the writings of the philosophers at all it really does seem to be a, a generic word it can be used interchangeably with any of these other loves but significantly when Um, when the Jews decided to translate their Hebrew scriptures into Greek, they chose this word agape to translate the Hebrew word chesed, which is covenant faithfulness or steadfast love, something you've actually heard a bit about in the service already this morning. So love is love. Well, which love is love. What love are you talking about? It's important to know this and this is actually a great way to get into a conversation with people when this sort of thing comes up. Um, When I first started in university student ministry, there was a a young woman out at McGill who uh, was studying uh, social work and in her final year took a course in psychology and she came and spoke to me after one of her lectures because her lecturer had put up on the screen 1 Corinthians 13 and gone through it line by line to tell the class why it was wrong. Now, I suspect what was going on there was he had no concept of agape as it's used in the New Testament. And what he was talking about was, in fact, eros. uh, That kind of love, romantic love or even lust... Well, you can go through that and see how it works in the opposite direction, can't you? Lust is impatient. Lust can be incredibly unkind if it doesn't get its own way. Love, can, uh, lust can be very envious. Uh, lust is often boastful and proud. It can be very rude. It is, it's extremely self-seeking. It can be very easily angered. And so you can go through this line by line and explain, well, why this is wrong if what you have in mind is in fact eros and not the covenant faithfulness love that we're called to as christians love the love of god the love that we're called to this love is a decision rather than an emotion and that's why in john chapter 13 love is in fact commanded You can't command somebody to feel a certain way. You can command somebody to act a certain way. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. That's a strange translation which comes across a little awkwardly. You must love each other in the same way that Christ loved you. That's extraordinary and a little bit frightening and overwhelming and as soon as I hear that, I feel incredibly inadequate. We just heard about the love of Christ as we celebrated communion. 
a love that lays its life down for the sake of the one that's loved. This kind of love isn't something that you fall in and out of. It's something that we must grow into as we follow Christ and are transformed by his word and as the Holy Spirit works within us as God conforms us to the image of his Son. This kind of love is always active. Eros can be completely passive. Eros can just admire from a distance and waste away life in daydreams. But the love that God calls us to must always be at work. In James' letter, true faith expresses itself in love. Um, in James 2.8, he writes, If you really fulfil the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing well. Now, in James' letter, if you're familiar with it, you know that he talks um, about works. And when James is talking about works, he's not talking about works of law like Paul does in Romans or Galatians. He's talking about works of love. Because love works. So he says in chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? And the answer, of course, is it's, it's no good at all. Love is not something you can just give lip service to. Love is something you must do. The writer of Hebrews connects love and works as well. Um, Crystal got really close to it this morning and stopped just before we got there. No, actually, she did read it. She didn't finish the sentence. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Uh, good works or works of love don't make you right with God any more than works of the law can make us right with God. That has to be absolutely clear in your heads. This isn't the way that you can make God pleased with you. This isn't the way in which you can cover your sin. It's not going to do that. But they are a sign of genuine faith. Genuine faith will express itself in obedience and the commandment of Christ is love one another. So love, this agape love, covenant faithfulness, is what's supposed to mark us out as Christians. By this we'll all know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. If this is so, and we know it's so because Jesus said it, if this is what we're called to, if this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and this is a core part of our witness to the world, then we need to know what love is. Now, I've shared with you from time to time some of the sad statistics about our Church of Christ movement how back in the 1950s, um, when Adelaide had a population of 500,000 people, Churches of Christ had a membership of 30,000. And now that Adelaide has a population of 1.5 million, we have a membership of less than 3,000. The church is dying. And we need to ask the question, why? Why? There's certainly, in many corners, a simple loss of faith. We no longer believe in the resurrection. We no longer believe in the atoning sacrifice of Christ on the cross. But there's always this danger that if we have faith and not love, that the church will die as well. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, uh, John is instructed 
by Jesus to write letters to the seven churches um, in Asia. And the first letter that he writes is to the church in Ephesus. And this is part of what he says to that church. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Uh, Later on, he goes on to describe the fact that this church in Ephesus has been really cautious in who they let speak. There have been false teachers called the Nicolaitans and they haven't tolerated them. This sounds like a good church, doesn't it? The sort of church that we'd all like to be associated with. Good teaching, no false doctrine, they're persevering in faith. But then Jesus says to this church, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Now it's actually been common to interpret this as um, what's, what's waning is their love for Christ. But I don't think that's really what's being said here. There are seven letters to seven churches. In the fourth letter, which is the central one of the seven, that gives us an interpretive key. So to the church in Thyatira, uh, John writes, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Love and faith, service and perseverance. They're a little word pairing. Here is the interpretive key. Love and service go together because love will always be at work. Faith and perseverance go together. Those that have faith persevere in the face of persecutions, in the face of false doctrines and false teachers. And so when we come back, To the church in Ephesus, this teaching church, this this church which has all of its doctrine right, Jesus says to this church, you've forgotten the love you had at first. He's not saying you've forgotten the love that you had for me. It's you have forgotten the love that you had for one another. And I think this actually becomes clear when you look at the next verse. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Love works. Love must always be at work. And they've become complacent in the love that they have for one another. Now listen to the last part of verse 5. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. If the people of God do not persist in love, the light has gone out and there is no longer any viable witness. This actually sounds a bit like the beginning of 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. Now, we've been involved in a, a number of churches over the years. And I've certainly heard of many churches that have gone through hard times. And the thing that seems to be at the heart of a church falling apart, dissipating, disappearing, is when the people stop loving each other. We were involved in a church once where um, they ran a a wonderful little kids club on a Friday afternoon. Um, A lot of families brought their kids along that had no connection with church. And one of the mums was so grateful for this work that was being done for her kids that she decided to, as a response of gratitude, go and help tidy up in the kitchen. 
and she got her head bitten off because she dared to put the green cup in the blue cup cupboard. And as you can imagine, she never went back. But churches have been destroyed as people fight over the colour of the carpet, how we should paint a room, what songs we should sing, where the communion table should be, things that are not of love. Love does not insist on its own way is one of the things we're going to hear in 1 Corinthians 13, but boy, when we do insist on our own way, can't we bring destruction to a place? Mick Jones wrote that song, I want to know what love is. If we are the people of God, we need to know what love is. Now, there's, there's a beautiful little story that comes out of that song. Uh, Lou Graham, who was the lead singer of Foreigner, had a little bit of input into that song. Um, was caught up in the whole rock and roll scene. His life was a mess. And after a concert one night at the Madison Square Gardens, he, he describes that as he was singing that song to the crowds, he felt the emptiness and the hopelessness of his own life. He knew that he needed to know what love was and he checked himself into a, a rehabilitation facility and the chaplain that worked there shared the gospel with him and he gave his life to Christ. Um, Mick Jones, who wrote the song, I, I don't know what's happened to him, but something really interesting, in, in 1997, um, our own Tina Arena, if you remember back to um, Young Talent Time days, um, Tina Arena released a cover of this and Mick Jones wrote a new bridge for the song. And this song sounds awfully, this new bridge sounds awfully like a prayer. These are the new words which he inserted into his own song. Lord, help me to be strong. On this road I travel on. When I'm lost and lonely, find me. My journey's just begun and I'm not the only one. Someone to know. I want to know what love is. Someone to know. Love is not a thing. Love is a person. How do we know what love is? Well, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So we're going to work our way through Paul's description of love in 1 Corinthians 13, word by word and line by line. And I know that as I read through it, I see how far I fall short. But we need to live in obedience to the calling of Christ that we love each other as he loves us and lay down our lives for one another. We have the perfect example. We know the love of God because it came to us in Jesus Christ. Now, this is who God calls us to be as his people. I'd encourage you to go and read 1 Corinthians 13 again and again and again. You know, there's an instruction in the Old Testament for the Jews that to take the law and put it onto their hands and keep it on their forehead. It's always in their thoughts and their actions is really what it's meant to communicate. I think we need to do the same thing. We need to have these words written on our hearts. To love as he loved us. Let's pray. 
Uh, thank you, Heavenly Father, that you've given us the answer. You've brought the revelation of true love, of perfect love, of covenant faithfulness, of steadfast love, a love a love which must have been so hurt by our sinfulness, by our rebellion and rejection of you, a love that reached out despite the anger, the, the rightful anger against us for our sin, a love that reached out to enemies, a love that died in order to save the sinner. Father, thank you for the love that's revealed to us at the cross. Thank you for the love that's revealed to us in the flesh and blood of your Son. And we know that we've all sinned and fallen short of your glory, but Father, we know that your intention was that we would perfectly reflect your glory. So our prayer is, by your Spirit and through your Word, be at work in our hearts Transform us into the people you've called us to be. Help us to love as he loved us. Amen.